we're going to go ahead and analyze a dipole antenna, but this one is going to be an infinitesimally small dipole antenna. So what that's going to look like is the following. We're going to go ahead and have our dipole elements fed by a transmission line over here. And the length of that dipole is going to be symmetric and it's uh, going to be L. So one half is going to be L over 2 and the other half is going to be L over 2. We're going to drive that antenna with a sinusoidal current. In this derivation we're going to take, since it, it is an infinitesimally small dipole, we're going to take, let's take a point R, and it's going to be, starting from the center here from the origin, it's going to be much, much greater. This R is going to be much, much greater than the, the length L. So that's what it's going to mean to be an infinitesimal dipole. So R is going to be much, much greater than L. Our strategy for this derivation, these derivations today, are going to be, we're going to start with a current. From there, we're going to get the vector potential. From there, we're going to get the magnetic field, H. From there, we're going to get the electric field, E. And from there, we're going to get the pointing vector, S. So the vector potential, A, as a function of position vector R, is equal to mu naught over 4 pi times the integral over the volume of J of R divided by R dV. These two quantities here, we're going to go ahead and look a little bit closer. And we're going to notice that if we consider our antenna element to be with a cross-section ds, and length dl, like I said, a length dl. And the current coming out of that cross-section, current j coming out of that cross-section, we can then say that j of r dv can also be expressed in terms of j or position vector r times ds, which we define here as the cross-section, times dl, this distance right here giving us our volume element. And we're going to go ahead and also do it in the uh, az direction. In other words, in the z direction so that we have the unit vector a Z sub z hat being our unit vector along the z direction. The reason we're doing this is so that we can go ahead and take these two elements right here and notice that that is the definition of current. And we substitute i of r for current. Okay? So, Next, we're going to assume that we have a, an oscillating current, of course, as we would imagine, because we have uh, a dipole antenna. We're going to be driving it with an alternating current. It's going to be I naught e to the minus I kr. That implies that J of R then becomes I naught e to the minus I k r dot d l dot a z hat, which then implies that our vector potential, 
So position of as, as a function of position vector r is equal to our constants mu naught over 4 pi times, and since we're looking in terms of this length, we're going to say minus L over 2, 2, L over 2 of I naught e to the minus I k r over r dl dot az hat. At this point, we take a uh, take a little bit of time to look at this approximation that uh, r is constant. And it can be seen in the following way. We have our dipole here. And if we pick an r that's far enough away, then the argument is going to be that if I make a, a displacement interval r sub l over 2, and another displacement vector over here. R sub minus L over 2. That those are going to be the same. Essentially, we're going to look for an independence of R. Or R being constant. So, written it, writing it down mathematically. If R is much, much greater than L then it follows that r sub l over 2 is more or less equal to r to the minus l over 2, which then implies that r is constant. With r constant, let's now look at our vector potential equation. Again, we have r being much, much greater than the wavelength lambda, being much, much greater than l, the length of our dipole. Again, we're in the infinitesimal dipole case. So then, our vector potential, a as a function of position vector r, becomes mu naught over 4 pi. And now we can take off i naught, of course, that's a constant. But notice, we can now take out e to the minus i k r over r. And then we have the interval minus l over 2 to l over 2 dl dot az hat. This integral right here is really L evaluated from minus L over 2 to L over 2. That's L over 2 then, minus minus, or plus L over 2. So that becomes an L. That gives me an L. And our expression for A of R finally becomes mu naught over 4 pi times I naught e to the minus I k R over r times l times unit vector z in the in the z direction unit unit vector in the z direction so that's one of our results that is a result for the for a for the vector potential at this point, let's notice that we're going to be using, well, let's take a, take a look at this. We're expressing our vector potential in terms of rectangular Cartesian coordinate uh, system. In other words, you have a z here. We need to express it in terms of spherical coordinates because there's spherical symmetry to this problem. So let's go ahead and remind ourselves how we're going to go ahead and be defining our spherical coordinate angles. Specifically, we have our XYZ rectangular Cartesian coordinate system. This is X, this is Y, this is Z. And we have our vector R here. 
and it's going to be defined, this point is now going to be defined as r, theta, and phi. So if we drop our projection onto the xy plane, and we go ahead and draw from the origin, to this point, and when, then we draw our y component, and we draw our x component, we have this angle right here, defined as theta, and this angle right here, defined as phi. So again, we're just going to be, we're going to be changing from rectangular Cartesian coordinate systems over to spherical coordinates. Well, then the problem becomes, how do we change a sub c? What, how do we express a sub c, a unit vector in the z direction, in terms of unit vectors in r hat, theta hat, and phi hat? Let me make uh, this use of the this little aside to show exactly how we do it. So what we're trying to do is go from unit vector ax, ay, az to r, theta, phi, hat. For that, we use this matrix, which can be looked up, times the unit vectors in the rectangular Cartesian coordinate system, and we end up with spherical coordinate system unit vectors. So this matrix right here is calling it A in this uh, derivation, is the transform or transformation matrix from rectangular Cartesian coordinate system to spherical coordinate system. But that's, that's not exactly what we want. We want AZ in terms of these, these quantities. So since this is a matrix now that gets us from here to here, what we'd have to do is we'd have to take the inverse of that matrix to go ahead and get to the equations that we want. So specifically, we want, we want to go from spherical to rectangular Cartesian. So given A, we find A to the minus 1, or the inverse of matrix A. Uh, for millinear algebra, we go ahead and compute the inverse to be that uh, quantity, or that matrix there. And that multiplied times R, theta, and phi hat gives us AX, AY, and AZ hat. Specifically, AZ hat is equal to cosine theta, cosine 2 phi, divided by cosine 2 phi, and that's where we get this cosine theta term here, multiply times r hat, that's where we get r hat. And then az is also uh, going to be requiring this term to be additive, so minus sine theta cosine 2 phi divided by cosine 2 phi multiplied by theta hat. There's the minus sine theta right there. The cosine 2 phi's uh, divide out, and the theta hat comes here. And then the third term that would be additive would be this term times phi hat, but that's zero. So a sub z is equal to cosine theta r hat minus sine theta theta hat. Just a little bit of an aside there, but it should make the derivation a little bit cleaner. So all we do in this next step is just simply write down our equation for the vector potential a as a function of the position vector equals to mu naught over 4 pi times i naught e to the minus i k r over r times l times the cosine of theta a sub r hat minus the sine of theta a sub theta hat. That is the first result of note. That is the uh, equation that we wanted for the vector potential. That was one of the equations that we really wanted in terms of spherical coordinates. Right? We had derived it already, but it was in terms of uh, rectangular Cartesian coordinates. So this one here will be more useful for what we're going to do next which is understand this antenna radiation pattern spherically. Okay. Next, what we do is we remember that the magnetic flux equals to del cross 
a, a being the vector potential. And the other definition that we have is the magnetic field is equal to the magnetic flux divided by mu zero. Now, B equals to del cross A is equal to one over R squared sine theta times the determinant of A R, R A theta, R sine theta A phi hat, D D R, d d theta d d phi and then we have the r component of the vector potential r times the theta component of the vector potential and then r sine theta times the phi component of the vector potential once we do that we find out that h equals to b over mu naught is equal to a sub phi hat times r times sine theta divided by mu naught that's where that comes from right there times r squared times sine theta that r squared sine theta comes directly from that determinant times the derivative with respect to r of r a theta minus the derivative with respect to theta of a r. Here we can go ahead and cancel this, here, that, there. Our equation then becomes 1 over mu naught r times bracket mu naught over far pi times i naught times l times the derivative with respect to r of what well it's e to the minus i k r over r times r because there was an r multiplier here times minus sine theta minus d d theta 1 over r e to the minus i k r times cosine theta and let's not forget our unit vector in the phi direction a phi hat so here we can see something interesting R's cancel in this term right here, and uh, mu naughts cancel. That's something just to do some housekeeping. The important point is that R's are canceling up here. Okay. Now we proceed <coughs> along these same lines by taking those derivatives. So this then becomes the constants i naught l over four pi. This is not a constant, but it's there, it's r. And then sine theta times ik times e to the minus i k r minus 1 over r e to the minus i k r times minus sine theta a phi unit vector which is equivalent to i naught l 4 pi r pull out the sine thetas pull out the e to the minus i k r and we have the following i k plus 1 over r times a phi hat we're going to put this in a particular form that's going to be apparent in a minute why we're doing this specifically we take the r inside of our bracket so that becomes sine theta 
and then our bracket minus k over ir minus 1 over ir squared e to the minus i kr times our unit vector in the phi direction. And continuing with this, doing some uh, multiplications and divisions by i, we end up with minus i naught L k squared over 4 pi times sine theta 1 over i k r. I'm coming up with a plus sign here, 1 over i k r squared. I saw it in another derivation as a negative sign, so that's what, what I'm finding out there. e to the minus i k r times the unit vector in the phi direction. The important thing to note here from this expression is that it makes it very apparent that we have a 1 over r term and a 1 over r squared term. Remember that we're neglecting, uh, we're looking at the far field, so that translates into neglecting O over 1 over r squared, terms of the order of 1 over r squared. So then, once, so that essentially says that this can go to zero. It's an approximation, but it's called the far field approximation. We're invoking that, that far field approximation here. Now we can write down an expression for our magnetic field as a function of position vector r is equal to i, the imaginary constant, i0, zero, capital I0, zero, to differentiate the current term, times k times l over 4 pi times e to the minus i kr over r times sine theta times our unit vector in the phi direction. That is the second of our desired uh, quantities that we're going, or expressions that we were wanting to derive. So remember we started with j, then we got the vector potential, a, now we've got the magnetic field, h, so we're just about in the home stretch here. Having found h, now we com concentrate on the electric field as a position of as a function of the position vector r. This is equal to 1 over i omega epsilon naught del cross h of r. This is from Maxwell's equations. This is one of the one of the defining equations there. Uh, 1 over i omega epsilon naught times 1 over r squared sine theta. And here what we're doing is we're doing that same, using that same uh, determinant that we found before, that uh, the definition of del cross h. So I'm not going to do that one again. But I am going to take, of course, the term for uh, this particular, of uh, uh, particular interest to the cross product into the a phi term. So d d theta of r sine theta times h phi times the unit vector in the r direction in, in the r direction minus r a theta hat times the dr of r sine theta h phi That comes out to be, well, before we do that, we can actually notice that we have an r here and an r here in the numerator, and I'm sorry, here and here in the numerator, because that's a derivative with respect to theta, so the r could come in the front. So that can cancel one of those r's as that cancels there. So now we can actually write down 1 over i omega epsilon naught times bracket a r hat 
over r sine theta times d d theta of sine theta h phi minus a theta unit vector d dr of r h phi. In this next step, then, we can write down the expression for E as a function of position vector r. This is i z naught k. Well, I think, I think we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Before we go ahead and do that, let's go ahead and write down. We're not quite to this point yet. So it's 1 over i omega epsilon naught times ar over r sine theta times the imaginary constant i, i0, k, l over 4 pi times e to the minus i kr over r times d d theta sine squared theta minus a theta hat over r times i i zero k l over four pi times sine theta times the derivative with respect to r of this quantity r times e to the minus i k r over r. So as before, we can do some combination of terms. Specifically, we can cancel this r with this r, and we can combine these two to notice something interesting, that that is an r squared term. So now we're seeing an r squared term in terms of the electric field, just like we saw it in terms of uh, the magnetic field earlier. So then what we can say is that that's going to be a 1 over r squared term. So let's go ahead and neglect it. Neglect order of 1 over r squared. And then this becomes equals to approximately minus a theta hat over i omega epsilon zero times minus i k over r times i i zero k l over four pi times sine theta times e to the minus i k r and here we can go ahead and notice that that's negative with a negative will cancel out. This i cancels with that i. And now we have this expression. A theta hat times i k over omega epsilon zero times i zero k l over four pi times e to the minus i k r over r times sine theta. We can go ahead and clean this up a little bit by noticing that for our case, omega equals to kc, that's the dispersion relation that we're discussing with, discussing here. Then of course we have c equals to one over mu naught epsilon naught square root. These two expressions will combine here to give us epsilon zero over mu zero square root. And that is by definition one over the characteristic impedance, the inverse of the characteristic impedance of the vacuum. So 
we, the reason we're doing this is so that we can express the next expression, which is going to be our final form, in terms of the characteristic impedance. Now we can do the expression that I was about to write before, skipping that last page of, of uh, derivation. Approximately equal to, again in the far field regime, I times Z naught, that's our characteristic impedance of the vacuum, times K times I naught times L divided by 4 pi times our usual suspects e to the minus i k r over r times sine theta. And in this case, we have a sub theta unit vector. That is the expression that we were after for our electric field. Now, something to notice right here is that we have exactly the same expression as the h expression, but with a factor of z naught being different. So we could have gone ahead and skipped the previous uh, steps to independently derive E so that by just dividing H by Z naught. And as a matter of fact, you can confirm your result by doing exactly that, looking at the H expression from a few uh, steps back, looking at this expression and noticing that it's a Z naught as, as the only difference. Uh, so this serves as a confirmation. So it's not that we did work in vain, but it's actually comforting to see that it's a uh, it can be confirmed like this. Now we go on to our pointing vector, which, are, which is our final step. We're going to look at the average of the pointing vector. That's one half the real part of E, the vector E as a function of position vector R, crossed into the magnetic field complex conjugate R position vector. This is going to be equal to one half the real part of I Z naught K I naught L over four pi times E to the minus I K R over R times sine theta times, <clears throat> this is the complex conjugate of H, so every I becomes a minus I, a negative I. So in this particular case, we have minus I, I naught K L over four pi times E to the minus I K R over R times sine theta. And at this point, we look at the unit vector. So we have from one term, we have a theta unit vector crossed into a phi unit vector. Okay. Since these are cyclical components or unit vectors, the next unit vector is going to be a sub r with a positive sign in front. So that enables us to write our pointing vector as a function of position vector r averaged is equal to 1 half Z naught K I naught L quantity squared over 4 pi quantity squared times sine squared theta over R squared. So it's interesting to note that our power then is going to go with a sine squared of the angle, sine squared theta dependence. And it's also going to have as 1 over r squared. So the power goes as 1 over r squared, whereas the electric field goes as 1 over r, and the magnetic field goes as 1 over r. It actually makes sense that the product of the electric and the magnetic field then gives us this 1 over r squared uh, term. One final step, then, is to not just look at the pointing vector for one point in, in, the, uh, in the sphere, but integrate over the entire volume, the enti entire surface of the sphere. So we could come up with power radiated is equal to this integral right here 
over the surface of ds, element ds. So essentially we're taking the radiator power over the entire uh, shell or sphere. This becomes 1 half times z naught times k i naught l over 4 pi quantity squared times double integral 0 to 2 pi over 2 over phi 0 to pi over theta of sine squared theta over r squared times the surface integral element surface area element which is r squared sine theta d theta d phi immediately we see something interesting the r squares disappear and if you remember that starts looking like the Larmor derivation quite a bit because if you notice here we have this sine squared and this sine theta combining to give us a sine cubed integral but before we do that look at the d phi integral and notice that it's from 0 to 2 pi like in the Larmor integral we can go ahead and see that that gives us a 2 pi uh, because it, it'll be integral of d phi would give us phi evaluated from 2 pi to 0. The 0 doesn't contribute, the 2 pi contributes. So that gives us the following. 1 half z naught k i naught. And this is the reason I was writing this in a particularly strange way, this 4 pi squared on its own downstairs, because we're going to multiply times 2 pi and then times the integral of sine cubed from 0 to pi. Please refer to the Larmor equation derivation if you need to. There we actually go through the step-by-step -step derivation of the sine cubed integral from 0 to pi, and we come up with 4 thirds. Okay, so now we can say, okay, 2 cancels. This is uh, 4, so we have 2 4s here. 1 4 will cancel with this, and then 1 pi will cancel with this. So we'll have one four left over. So four times three is 12, and we'll have a single pi. So then we can write down for P radiated, again, integrated over the entire surface, is equal to Z naught times K I naught L quantity square over 12 pi. That is the final step in our derivations. And again, taking a step back, we've gone ahead and found quite a bit for our, from our infinitesimal dipole. And it's different enough from the, uh, the video on the accelerating charge or the single accelerating charge. We found out that in particular, the, uh, the electric field is very interesting. It's got a one over R dependence. The magnetic field is one, one over R dependence. The pointing vector has one over R squared, uh, sine squared dependence. And the radiated power is not the Larmor formula, but it's a variant of that. And it's this one right here. So that fi finalizes the derivation for the infinitesimal dipole, uh, which is an inefficient antenna to be sure, but it's a good step to go from an accelerated charge to a finite dipole, uh, which would be the next step to, to derive. Anyway, that concludes the video today.